top 15 draft pick told me the other day, because we were involved in this conversation about Phil Jackson and the Knicks, and he said, Phil Jackson was falling in and out of sleep during my workout. About what? Phil Jackson. I think falling he is one of the all-time... Falling asleep at a workout? Yes. Falling, fa falling in and out of sleep at my workout. This is what this guy told me. Maybe he was just resting his eyes. <laughs> I do that all the time. That's what my grandmother used to do. Oh. What's good? Welcome to the best 60 minutes of your day. It's NBA Draft Day and projected lottery picks Jason Tatum and Josh Jackson, along with Hall of Famer and former executive of the year Joe Dumars, headline the guest list for the six. What's going to happen tonight? That's anybody's guess. The NBA Draft is one hour away, and Phil is one Chris Stapp's Porzingis trade away from Knicks fans storming MSG. But it sounds like Jamel, a division rival, might be prepared to pony up for the unicorn. Now forget about that. Let's get to the Knicks being a dumpster fire. Knicks fans are in full meltdown because Phil Jackson, as you said, is dangling Chris Stapps as trade bait. According Small. to Ian Begley, Boston offered the Knicks its number three pick, a player, and an additional lottery pick that they might get in tonight's draft. But don't worry, Knicks fans. Just trust and feel. As much as we value Chris Stapps and, you know, what he's done for us, when a guy doesn't show up at an exit meeting, everybody starts speculating on, you know, the duration or your you know, movability from a club. So we've been getting calls and, uh, you know, uh, we're listening, but we're not uh, intrigued yet at this level. But uh, as much as we love this guy, you know, we have to do what's good for our club. Knicks fans were a little uneasy as to what's going on here. What can you say to them? Well, I think we know what we're doing. That's what I can say to them. Let me take a deep breath. Try to ask this question without laughing. Is it possible that Phil Jackson knows what he's doing? Quite possible. Quite possible. See, I okay, mean, you can't be serious. Take, no, you no, can't be take serious. your own advice and take a deep breath. I know everybody wants to believe that Phil Jackson is asleep at the wheel. I'm dead serious when I say there is nothing to see here. Everything is fine, okay? Knicks fans, be like a bunch of Fonzies. What's, what's Fonzie like? Come on, cool. Jamel, what's Fonzie like? Cool. That's right, correct the mundo. Just be cool. There is nothing to be concerned about. See, the issue is, is that when you hear things and you see the messenger, sometimes it doesn't process properly. So I want to put this quote up on the screen and read it to you slowly so that you don't miss what he's saying. We're getting calls, not dangling like you said, we're getting calls. As much as we value Chris Stapps and what he's done for us, when a guy doesn't show up for an exit meeting, comma, everybody, as in other teams, starts speculating on the duration or movability from a club. So in other words, hey, it's dysfunctional, let's call and see what they'll offer us. Then he says, we've been getting calls and we're listening, but we're not intrigued yet at this level. But as much as we love this guy, we have to do what's good for our club, which is, said no one ever about the Knicks, smart business. David Aldridge said that the Knicks are looking at Chris Stapps as if he would be the number one pick in this year's draft and next year's draft, and they're negotiating accordingly, that the price is sky high. So if Phil Jackson is asking for heaven and earth and the moon and stars, there is absolutely no reason to act like the sky is falling. There you go. You really just tried to make sense of just complete and utter Nothing's stupidity. been done. I get, look, like, that's not the point. Nothing's been that's done. Wait until, he, wait until all, he messes up the trade. I know the Knicks are so no, dysfunctional no, no, no. and it's a he bad trade be before it's made. He shouldn't even be a part made. of the trade. He can't he answer should, the phone? No, no, hang up on everybody. Hit reject. <laughs> B block everybody's number. Screen it? Chris Stapps Porzingis should never be a part of the plan. No matter what's no offered, Jamal? No matter Jamel? what. You Ever. Know, look. If Danny Ainge says you can have three, you can have three tonight, what, what, two what, picks what next year and Jalen Brown. Board. They drafted him to be the building block for the future, correct? Right. It, I'm sorry, did I miss something? Is he not? Yeah. Do, you, do you believe in the plan or do you not believe in the plan? If you're Phil Jackson, right? He's the plan, right? So why are you trading the plan? He is the plan. He said, no, he's not trading him. Okay, why, why are you even entertaining this? It's his job this? to listen. Why are you even entertaining this? Jamel, everybody has a price. There are things you wouldn't do, but if somebody hits the right number, you just might like, consider it. See, this is not a, about everybody of, uh, has a price. You know, I almost felt sorry for Knicks fans. Almost. But I don't. You know why I don't feel sorry for them? feel sorry for them because they don't want better for themselves. <laughs> they don't. They really don't want better for themselves. That's why you can have their owner, Jim Dolan, out there trying to be a broke nickelback performing <laughs> tonight while the draft is going on Ugh. and why you got 
Phil Van Winkle, all right? That's why you get in a situation like this, because you know what's going to happen? Come to the fall, they're going to all line up and show up at Madison Square Garden like none of this ever happened. I've said before. Right. It should, yeah, the fact that Phil Jackson would have the audacity to blame Chris Tapps Porzingis for his inep- ineptitude and incompetence is highly rich. Okay, highly rich. Because he's basically saying, oh, well, Chris Tapps, had you shown up for this all-important exit interview, treating this like uh, that it's, it's the most important thing that ever happened. Never mind that Shaq skipped the exit interview uh-huh. before with him before. So he's blaming him and saying, because you showed up, now people smell blood in the water. Phil, people can look at your record and smell blood in the water. That's fine. Okay? But, wait, if you want to criticize their dysfunction, that's fine. If you want to, if you want to talk about how he continues to mistreat Melo within the media. Melo which, and now poor and, and how some Somehow, some way, you know what's crazy? Has is there more of a polar opposite when it comes to a person in positions of power, the perception of those people as it relates to Phil Jackson, the executive, versus Phil Jackson, the coach? It's unbelievable how he might be as bad an executive as he as great as he was a coach. Maybe so if you want to blame him for being generally dysfunctional, that's fine. But the specificity of this situation, no trade has been made. The old adage is that the best trades sometimes are the ones you don't make. And when it comes to the Knicks, apparently, it's a bad trade before it's even made. It's a, Can we at least you know see what he bad? might get in return? Again, he might not even trade him. You can't separate the trade from who's trying to execute it. and You can't. I can't. No, I can't. Because, look, he got this right before by getting Chris Stafford to Porzingis. The one thing that Phil Jackson has done right is drafting this guy. So you're going to trade this dude away because you in your feelings about some exit That's interview. not why. He's not cutting off his nose sure? to spite his so face. So why is he bringing this, isn't this up? A, this isn't, it, we said, I'll read it to you again. I, when a guy doesn't show up for an exit interview, which we've been talking about on shows right. like this, so other teams start sudden, to do their job the exit interview and say, is a presidential hey, debate. Like, hey, all just of a sudden, curious, is that important? what would you give up for Chris Stapps Porzingis? Like, if you're doing your job, of course you're calling to see what Phil might be willing to do. He's not, he hasn't done it yet. He hasn't done, this isn't the Pacers pushing up to trade Paul George. I'm not defending the Knicks. I'm saying, like, can we wait dumb. and see? All this right. is just dumb. Let's ask some smart people. Okay. Let's get the very latest from Dave McMenamin, who is with the Celtics right outside of Boston, and Knicks reporter Ian Begley. So, Ian, what's the offer that Phil Jackson is waiting for, and how close is he to getting it? Boston, I'm told, has talked to the Knicks about giving them their number three pick tonight and acquiring an additional pick ahead of that Knicks eighth pick tonight. So giving them two lottery picks in the top seven tonight and adding some combination of Avery Bradley, Jalen Brown, or Marcus Smart. And that deal is on the table. And that's something that probably would not happen until the draft starts. So that's an offer that has yet to be really on Phil Jackson's plate in a serious way. And if things continue to to pro, uh, progress as I expect them to, I think that offer might be in Phil's lap. And, and then he has a tough choice to make. And he's also hearing, I've heard, from Phoenix. I think the Phoenix talks are still alive. They still want to get in and see if they can get Chris Stapps Porzingis from Phil Jackson. But we all know that Phil has to be blown away here to even start to think about trading Chris Stapps Porzingis. I don't know if that Boston offer does it. I don't know if Phoenix have an, has an offer that can do it. So real quick, Ian, I'm sorry. Give me, give me the, the Celtics' best offer as you understand it. One more time. Run it down again. Celtics' best offer. Yeah, so that's Boston's number three pick. Uh-huh. And that's also an, an additional pick in the top seven that Boston would trade for tonight. And then a combination of either Avery Bradley, Jalen Brown, or Marcus Smart. That's the pack- one of the packages that I heard that the Celtics and Knicks have discussed. Yeah. And again, because we're dealing with that additional pick tonight, it's right. not something that really would come to fruition until during the draft. And obviously they have the eighth pick. I like Jalen Brown going with some lottery picks, but that's still not enough for Porzingis, so... It okay. shouldn't even be a discussion. Okay. But let's go to the other side of this. Dave, so you heard what Ian said about the price, but how high of a price is Danny Ainge actually willing to pay for Chris Tapps Porzingis? Well, first of all, why would they start bidding against themselves? Uh, as Ian just detailed, that, that's, a, that's a pretty fair and reasonable offer. But the Celtics are all about flexibility and striking at the right moment. That's how Danny Ainge has managed this franchise for over a decade now. Uh, they could just be happy with using the number three pick, getting a guy like Jason Tatum, getting a guy like Josh Jackson, and perhaps that can be a, a player that is a close approximation of Chris Porzingis anyway. Uh, now, certainly Porzingis has two years of track record on the court, and that's why they are interested in trying to put together a deal to get him. 
But at this point, they're not going to go crazy to, again, drum up the price and only bid against themselves. Now, I had a, a source familiar with the talks already say that they were ridiculous the asking price coming from Phil Jackson to Thank get you. Porzingis. And really, right now, it, it, it's I wouldn't say it's dead, but it, it's on the back burner. They have not spoken since this morning. It's not like these talks have been progressing. The Celtics heard what the Knicks wanted. They said, okay, thank you, put, put down the phone, and they went on to work on other deals. There you go. Nothing is intimate. But if things change, fellas, Ian, Dave, don't have to take, give our producers a call. We'll stop what we're doing, butt into the show with some breaking news, okay? Uh, it's not as hot, but Danny Ainge is sort of under fire from lots of Celtics fans who have cooled to his collecting assets strategy. They want to see him deliver another star. He could have as many as eight first-round picks over the next four drafts, plus not quite yet max money to spend in free agency this summer to add to a top-seeded team, though one, of course, coming off a sweep at the hands of the Cavs. So you heard what Dave just said uh, about the Celtics not bidding against themselves. But that said, Jamel, is it a must that Danny somehow, some way? get this deal done at whatever cost. I think For Porzingis was, in particular. Yeah, I'm, I'm strictly dealing with him because I think it's a, we're talking about a different conversation if you're talking about uh, Jimmy Butler. And if, for some reason, if you wanted to throw Paul George in that mix, they need to do whatever they can to get Chris Tapps Porzingis. What is the point of amassing all these assets and putting yourself in this position if you can't strike when opportunity is there. It takes two to deal. It, it, it does. How much would you pony up for the unicorn? How much, if you're Danny, what do you give up? Do you give up Brooklyn's pick? Do you give up, you know, that Lakers I'd Kings pick? I'd give up pick? the number three for sure. This year? Yes, okay. I would give up the number three for sure this year. They can have basically anybody else, maybe except Avery Bradley, okay? Um, Jalen Brown? Brown for sure. Brown? I would give up Jalen Brown. Because, look, the one thing I love about this for the Celtics, you're talking about a seven-foot uh, well, that's right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. Celtics got, got, got one game. They didn't get swept. Sorry. Thanks for the correction. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they did get. It was a gentleman's sweep. It was a gentleman's yeah. sweep. Yeah. All right. So you're talking about a seven foot big man in an age where obviously the three point shot has become crucial, especially among people of his size. You're talking about a game changer. All right. I just wonder how many more times are you going to get your butt kicked by LeBron James before you actually get up and do something when the moment is there? It's one thing if you give up something for unfulfilled promise. And I get it. In the draft, you're looking at that as building blocks for the future. But, you know, these future draft picks and future cap space, like at some point you have to make a move. And this is so perfect. Do it now. See, I don't think they have to do this trade. If it's not the right package for Danny Ainge, I don't think it's imperative that the Celtics do it. Like, they can't go wrong. Like, either way, if they they execute this pick. But they can go really right. Okay? They can go really right. That was a good rebuttal. Okay. That was a good rebuttal. That was good. <laughs> right. That was good. That was good. That was good. They, I don't think they can go wrong, though, honestly, because if you execute this third pick and you take Jason Tatum, you know, a, a forward, a combo forward type that can guard one through four, that, that's, a, that's a guy that can get his own shot, that's got a lot of potential, you take him and then you focus on free agency, whether that's Gordon Hayward, whether that's Blake Griffin, you still have free agency to so play again. with this summer. And then you have these two picks next year, so I just don't see it as a situation where if the Celtics don't get Porzingis or, for that matter, another established star, that they've somehow dropped the ball. I mean, they still have a very good team. Tatum, they got people, I don't want to put this on the kid, but they got people comparing him to Paul Pierce in terms of his scoring ability, his, 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 his savvy when it comes to his mid-range game and that sort of thing. So, I'm with you on it would be great to see them get Porzingis. New Yorkers would go crazy because it's one thing to trade Chris Stapps Porzingis. It's one thing to yeah. be a dysfunctional franchise. It's something altogether different to help out the Celtics right. if you're a Knicks fan. But it would be great because not, now you're talking, well, does that put them over the hump Against Cleveland, again, gentlemen sweep. My mistake. I don't want Boston coming for me. I got that wrong. It wasn't a sweep. Felt like it. Does that put them over the hump against Cleveland? And Porzingis, I'll say, Porzingis does. Porzingis does, yeah. And I'll say yes. And then I'll go farther and say, do they have something for Golden State? Maybe. Which is why you Porzingis. do it. Which is why you do it. Okay, look, all due respect to Jason Tatum, who I'm sure will be a fine player. We'll talk to him in a moment. That doesn't get you over LeBron. Look at Markel Fultz. With the Spalding shoes. Or maybe it's not Spalding, but they're made of basketballs. Those look clean, oh, I have to say. He told us to watch out for his shoes. Yeah, that's a nice look right there. Nice little you know, brown to go with the suit and the bow tie. So all good. All right. Let's really make this a party, Mike. Let's go five wide, sort of, kind of. Uh, Reese Davis, <laughs> Reese Davis, Jay Billis, Jay Williams, all there at the Barclays Center tonight for our draft coverage. Reese, uh, let's start with you. You're the host of the draft, obviously. And Chad Ford's latest mock, the top seven picks are one and done players. Now, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver recently said the system is, quote, not working for anyone. How would you change the system so that it works for both the NCAA and the NBA? 
I think that's a really difficult question, and it's a complex answer. I think it's really easy for people to say just raise the age limit to 20. That'll keep them in school for two years, and that'll help everybody. But there will be some other consequences from that. I think that would uh, that would incentivize players perhaps to look overseas to the D League, play somewhere else. So really, the entire complex answer I would say is. Let players enter the draft whenever they want to at 18 if they want, but if things don't go well, then they can go back to college. Along with that, you would also have to find a way for the college players to have more freedom economically to make it more attractive to stay in school. I don't know that there is any way to fix it. It's just sort of where we are right now, but I certainly don't think making them wait longer without any type of concessions to the economic realities for the college players would do a lot to help the whole one-and-done situation and make it better for everybody. NBA would benefit by getting an older player in the league. I think there's no question about that by and large in most cases. All right, Jay Will, after breaking down the tape of all these prospects, who's your favorite player in this draft? Mike, I, I love Dennis Smith Jr. Now, everybody talks about Lonzo Ball, De'Aaron Fox, Markel Fultz, number one pick presumptively. But Dennis Smith Jr. reminds me of Baron Davis. And, look, there have been rumors that there have been some issues between him and his head coach, Mark Gottfried, at NC State. Scouts have said that at times it seems like he's lethargic. He takes plays off. But I'm telling you, watching this kid two years ago at the Elite 24, he came down the lane. He was piping it on people left and right. His range extends all the way to half court. He is one of the most di dynamic scorers we have in this draft, and nobody is talking that much about him. He deems himself as being underrated. This kid plays with a chip on his shoulder, and he's Baron Davis nasty. All right, Jay Billis, uh, five years ago, the Warriors took Draymond Green in the second round, 35th overall. Do you see a Draymond Green in this draft? Not necessarily skill-wise, but somebody who was taken late but could have a huge impact. That, that's kind of a tough question, Jamel, because if I saw that, I'd rank him up in the top five. Um, so it's hard, to, it's hard to see somebody rank down at the end of the first round or start of the second, and you think he's going to be a, a great player. Usually that's where you're going to find a rotation player if you're lucky to get a starter. Uh, but I, I will tell you that I think T.J. Leaf of UCLA is an undervalued prospect. Leaf is a, an excellent perimeter shooter. Uh, he's athletic. You know, 6'8", can really run as a trail three-point shooter. He, his numbers are excellent, and he's really tough. Like, he can put the ball on the floor. He attacks the basket and finishes. Uh, and then also, I think Justin Patton of Creighton uh, is a player that could be undervalued as well. A couple guys you could see uh, going in the 20s, but it could also, could also wind up late lottery. All right, fellas, we appreciate it. We look forward to hearing more from you guys at the top of the hour once draft coverage kicks off following the six on ESPN. Appreciate the knowledge. All right, we got more company. Hall of Famer, former executive of the year. Joe D is in the house from Louisiana, obviously. Yeah, the former we claim Detroit now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Louisiana yeah, has to share them with absolutely. us. And absolutely. And brought us three titles, one as an exec and yeah. two as a player. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we know you've been in this position uh, before, obviously, in terms of having to make some of these key decisions. But it's been a lot going on in the NBA, not just with the draft, but with various yeah. trades and, and, and a lot of scuttlebutt at this point. But let's just uh, keep it to the draft right now. Um, Lonzo Ball, he's mm -hmm. been a player that everybody's been talking about in terms mm -hmm. of is he, is he a transformative player? Can he transform perhaps the Lakers? What's your assessment of Lonzo Ball? I like him as a player. I like him a lot as a player. He's, he's, a, he's a really, really good player. I, I, I don't what do you know like the most about him? The fact that he can see the court so well and he makes everybody better. Yeah. Like he plays winning basketball. Like you can see some good players, but they only make themselves better. This kid makes everybody else around him better than that, and that's what I really like about him. I'm transformative, I'm not sure about that, but he's going to make the team better. Whoever he goes to, he's going to make them better. ESPN's uh, analytics projections have him with the lowest bust percentage at 29% among draft prospects. Um, but the history of number two picks... Most oh, recently, don't talk about the history. Yeah, I know. Too. I, I know. Look, oh, it's, see, it's, it's too soon. Is oh, it? God. I, 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 oh, let's talk about it right now. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Let's just. I, know, I, I, I was going to say with the Lakers, even most recently, D'Angelo Russell. They just shipped him oh, to Brooklyn. It's like, right, is it, right. you know, like what is it about that spot, or is, what do you see in Lonzo that gives you pause? You said you don't want to call him transformative, but it's something about his game, whether it's the shooting motion, athleticism, defense, whatever, that makes you say. As much as he's hyped, as much as his dad, we talked about him in the L.A. connection, mm -hmm. he may not pan out after all. You know what? I think that we've all come to expect that if a guy is in the top five, he's going to be transformative. Mm -hmm. It's just not the case. It, it, it's rare that you're going to get all five guys. Even if you think about KD going two, mm -hmm. like, I, I know it was injuries with um, 
Big fella. With Greg Oden. With yeah. Greg Oden, yeah. But, you know, I, I'm saying it's tough, man. That top five, it's not going to always be that, that franchise-changing player. It's just, it's just not the reality of it. So, it, it, and, it, and if you miss there, yeah. it's tougher when you miss, you know, other places. So yeah. this is the last time tonight, <laughs> the last time <laughs> for a long time, uh, that you will see the 76ers drafted in the top squad. five. I'm all about the process. Okay. And it ends tonight with Markel Fultz going number one. That we, we think we know he's going first overall. Okay. All around game he flashed at, uh, at UW. You know, what are your, expect, are your expectations as high as mine, not just for him, but for the Sixers immediately? I think they hit the ground running. Everybody healthy with Sarge and Simmons and obviously mm-hmm. Embiid and now Fultz. I think they hit the ground running and make the playoffs in the East this year. You, are you on this process bandwagon with me? I, I like their team. I like the what breaks. they've done. Should I pump the brakes? No, no. You don't have to pump the brakes. Um, it's about what you expect of them. So you said, I expect them to make the playoffs. I know. I'm just, just is that too much? No, no. no okay. It's not too much. I like that. Yeah. I like okay. that. No, Mike, I like that. Yeah. I think they can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you start talking about can they compete at the highest level, though, you're going to have to add some veterans. Very few times are you ever going to see 19- and 20-year-olds competing at that, at that level. Yeah. Even, even when people say Golden State is young. Those guys say, okay, he's 29. It's Steph 29. They look young. But those guys have been around a while. So in the NBA, you can have really, really good young talent. But at some point along the way, that process, you're going to have to add some veterans in there to help those guys get over the hump. It's a destination now. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. 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 That's what all the cap, mo- yeah. cap yeah. money they'll have this summer. I know that's a lot to put on those kids. I'm just so excited about it. But they it. can make the playoffs, though, Mike. I- yeah. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Right. Let's check in with Jeff Goodman and Ramona Shelburne. Uh, Jeff, let's start with you here. So Paul George, Jimmy Butler, uh, Reports that there's a stalemate between the Lakers and the Pacers. Jimmy Butler maybe could still be on the move. He's hanging out with D-Wade and Gabby in Europe right now, but the Timberwolves and Tom Thibodeau seem to be interested in him. What are you hearing about both those veteran swingmen and the chances that they can move tonight, Jeff? You know, it's going to be interesting tonight whether either of these guys get dealt. Certainly, Paul George. I talked to a Pacers source earlier, Michael, and he said, listen, Kevin Pritchard, is not going to be forced into doing something that he's not ready to do, uh, the Pacers' new GM. Right now, they don't have a lot of leverage. There's only a couple teams in the mix. The Cavs don't have a GM. The Lakers feel like they don't have to make a move because they're going to get Paul George in a year. So who knows if George gets moved. Jimmy Butler, a different scenario. A lot of people talking about whether he'll go to Minnesota. Tibbs love coaching him. We know that. But the, the issue here is Gar Foreman and Paxson and Tibbs don't get along. So are they going to want a deal and one of them come up on the loser's side? Then you've obviously got Jimmy Butler. Could he go to the Celtics? Danny Ainge has a ton of assets to trade. Denver, I'm told recently, has entered the mix for Jimmy Butler. Mm. A lot of people trying to get in the mix for Butler. But will they get Gar Foreman and Paxson to pull the trigger for a rebuild with the Bulls. Yeah, not a lot of incentive for them to help out uh, their former coach. Ramona, even though you're at the Lakers facility, uh, let's ask about the Spurs, because I know you got some intel on that, specifically them testing the market for, market for LaMarcus Aldridge. What type of interest is San Antonio getting for L.A.? Well, it's interesting because, you know, LaMarcus Aldridge only has one more year before he has to decide whether to pick up his player option on the rest of his contract. And so that lessens your trade value right there. Plus, he's an older player, and you're talking about – they've talked to teams who have lottery picks, top ten picks. And so, you know, right now, today is a day of hope, right? Everybody, everybody sees these kids, and they see all the positives, and they ignore all the negatives, right? And so this is the day that you that – you, those draft picks have the most value. And so it's hard to trade into that top ten, even with a player as accomplished as LaMarcus Aldridge, but I think a more interesting question in some ways is what is San Antonio up to? Brian Windhorst reported earlier that Danny Green and the, that the Cavs have talked about Danny Green with the San Antonio Spurs, and so clearly San Antonio is trying to clear some cap space to make a run at a free agent this summer. From what I'm told, we've already heard they're interested in Chris Paul. Mark Stein reported that a few weeks ago, but I'm told they're interested also in Derrick Rose and in George Hill. George Hill obviously used to be there, and so they need to create some kind of cap space this summer to make run at any of those free agent point guards. Watch Derrick Rose go ball out in San Antonio. <laughs> Jill Dumar is still kicking it with us on the six. So you heard Jeff Goodman talk about the Cavs working without a GM. They were supposed to be right in the midst before letting go of David Griffin, right in the midst of maybe talking about Paul George or Jimmy Butler. Our man Chauncey Billups, your man Chauncey Billups, reportedly has been offered the 
president of basketball ops gig mm-hmm. um, by the Cavaliers. Jamel thinks he should don't, wouldn't touch yeah. it with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> I say what you got Dan to lose. I think Dan Gilbert has shown what he thinks. There's a lot of complications of with that job, structures. but it is, you know, it is a, a primo job. You still got LeBron at least for a year. What advice would you give to Chauncey? Should he take well, this gig? He, he, here's what I would say to him. If you're going to take it, if you're going to take it, go all in. Because – these jobs are all incompetent. They consume you if you're going to do it the right way. As so you don't be Phil? Well, <laughs> here's what I'm going to say, Mike. Here's the thing I'm going to say. It's more than just drafting, trading, and signing free agents. You have to build a culture if you're going to win. And as you can see with some teams in the league, culture's not being built. And that's the problem. What Chauncey can do, he can help build a great culture. He understands. Well, maintain it. We, yeah, yeah, and maintain it. He understands that it takes that and not just, oh, we signed this good player and we're going to bring him to a toxic culture. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. You're not going to win. So I think that's where John, Chauncey would be really, really good. All right, since we're on the subject of toxic cultures, the Knicks, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Phil talking about he's fielding calls now for Chris Stapps Porzingis. <laughs> clearly put out by him not showing up for his exit interview. I think he should block and delete everybody who's calling him. Uh, what do you make of the situation with Porzingis and the Knicks? You know, uh, you know how we all grew up hearing, you know, don't put your business out in the street? Yeah. yeah. She does that to me so all the time. So their business got put out in the street with the missing of the uh, exit meetings. And once that got put out in the street, the calls that he's getting now, you get those every day. But the fact that their business got out there, Looks bad. But doesn't it look equally as bad, the fact that Phil is like, yep, I'm getting calls. Uh, and so far, nothing's blown us away. The fact that he's given uh, life to the foolishness. I, I wouldn't have said that. Okay. I, w- I wouldn't have gone on and said we're getting calls. But I'm just saying that's why you always hear people talk about, and let's keep this internal. Because once it's out there, it takes on a life of its own. It's and like so, and, and, and here's the other thing I would say, too. It's a lot different coaching than being in management. It's a lot different thinking about minutes and substitution and playing time and all this stuff as opposed to these issues that you're dealing with. And so that's, you know, probably a learning curve for Phil. We're up against the break, but real quick. So you, you, thank you. That's what I was saying earlier. Like, sharks in the water. That said, everybody you take calls on, you may not move them if you're asking for the moon and the stars, yeah. but there's nothing wrong with listening because you never know what you'll but get you offered, right? you don't tell people, right. as he just said, right. that right. you're listening. Right. Let me ask something. So that's basically putting them on the block implicitly. Could both of y'all be right? That's not how TV uh, works, man. Know, That's not how TV okay, works. Okay. But yes, 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 absolutely. All right, thank you, Joe Dumas. As we come up on the NBA draft, they're hoping that they can do what Edmonton did and land a stud like Connor McDavid. He is our Miller Time moment for joining Sidney Crosby and Wayne Gretzky, who did it twice as the only players to win the award, the MVP award before turning 21. McDavid led the league with 100 points, scoring 30 goals and notching 70 assists en route to leading Edmonton to its first playoff appearance since 05-06. Go ahead, Black Bear Marrows. I see you. <laughs> I was just reading. <laughs> All right, Josh Jackson is just one month older than McDavid, and we'll talk to him in a minute. But first, we welcome another top prospect, Jason Tatum. Now, normally, Mike, I don't like to insult our guests off top, but Jason Tatum, I have got to get at you about something that I read that you said about St. Louis and their food in particular in a food draft. You said that you would take St. Louis pizza, not ribs, but pizza, <laughs> number one. Look, if I were a GM, you'd be knocked down off my draft board just off that. <laughs> so you got to explain yourself, my man. I've never heard of St. Louis pizza. Man, it's, uh, you got to go to St. Louis to try it. I'm from St. Louis, so I might be partially biased, but uh, I w- I'd never lead you wrong. I promise that. Oh, that looks good. Well, now, there, I have a friend from St. Louis. He does swear by Emo's Pizza. Is that the spot? Oh, that's the best pizza on earth. All right. Well, I guess I can let you uh, live because of that. But look, moving on, I guess, uh, to more real news, if you will. Um, Obviously, tonight's a really big night for you. We've certainly heard a lot of rumors about where you might be headed. What have you heard in particular about where you might land tonight? Uh, I'm pretty sure we hear the same things. You know, I've just been uh, busy this week in New York. And every time I look on the TV, trade rumors are popping up on ESPN and uh, you know, it's been a pretty hectic week, and uh, I don't know i don't know any more than, than you guys probably know, so uh, I'm just uh, are nervous and uh, ready for the, the draft to start. I've seen you shun the label of a quote-unquote safe pick as if you don't have a lot of upside and room to improve. How does that make you feel when people look at you as more of a finished product than some of your fellow prospects? Uh, you know, all of us have things we need to work on, and... Uh, you know, just something I just got to take with a grain of salt. And, uh, you know, I just got to keep focusing on my game and keep getting better like I have. And, uh, 
you know, prove people wrong. Well, yeah. some other people have called you the best shooter in the draft. Do you believe you're the best shooter in the draft? Uh, I don't know. Luke Kennard, you know, my teammate from Duke, he might be the best shooter, but I do feel like I'm the best player and uh, the best offensively skilled guy. But, uh, I mean, we're going to see what happens tonight. Now, you, obviously you put on for food in St. Louis, but I know another thing that's near and dear to your heart in terms of your, your hometown, you've talked before about one of the first things you want to do is start a nonprofit for single moms. Why is such a cause so important to you? Because, uh, you know, just reflecting on my childhood, you know, my mom had me when she was 19. And, uh, you know, both of my parents were in my life, but, you know, I stayed with my mom my entire life. And, um, you know, it wasn't the easiest growing up, especially in St. Louis. And, you know, just all the sacrifices she had to endure, you know, to make it better for me. And, you know, as I got older, I just wish that, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, doing it, you know, starting a nonprofit and uh, being a blessing, you know, to another you know, single parent home and, and their child and just paying for utilities and bills, you know, while they're in school or, you know, working, trying to get back on their feet and just wishing or thinking, you know, how that would have helped us, you know, when I was a kid. All right. Well, some team is going to be very fortunate uh, when they turn your name in early in the draft. And may we both say subtle but sharp with the tuxedo selection. Good job. I'm looking good, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, another player who likely will have his name called early, Josh Jackson, who's trying to be the sixth player in Kansas history to be picked in the top four in the common draft era. If he is selected, he would join that lovely group, Joel Embiid, Andrew Wiggins, Drew Gooden, Rafe LaFrance, and Danny Manning. Hey, Josh Jackson, thanks for joining the six. I I'm saying hello. My co-host is still a little salty because you didn't go to Michigan State, but instead went to Kansas. <laughs> right? It so, could have been you and Miles uh, Bridges together, man. It would have been a beautiful oh, tandem. But it's like you're being recruited all over again. Everybody's after you. You read that you're the apple of a lot of teams' eye, people trying to move up into the draft to select you. How does it feel to be at the, at the center in the midst of all these trade rumors going into the draft? Um, I mean, it feels pretty good to be here. You know, it's a lot going on, trade rumors, and, you know, with teams trying to move up. But I just feel really good to be here. And I know I can't really control anything tonight. You know, I can't control who calls my name, where I get traded or anything like that. So I'm going to just make the best of whatever situation I'm presented with. Yeah, along those same lines, obviously this is a moment you probably dreamed of for a lifetime. So how have you imagined this going when your name is called? Have you thought about the emotions you might feel or what might be going through your mind? Uh, I definitely know emotions will be flying around. Um, hopefully my mom doesn't tear up because if she does, I probably will too. But, uh, you know, I know it's going to be a great night, especially one to remember for a long time. Now, some of the uh, draft analysts are saying that, that your shooting is the area that you need the most improvement. What have teams told you about your shooting as you've gone through this pre-draft process? And secondly, how do you plan to improve it? Uh, well, one of my struggles that came from shooting was mostly confidence, I think. Um, you know, since the end of our season at Kansas, I've been, you know, shooting every day, working on my shot. And I honestly feel like I've gotten a lot better. Uh, Obviously, you know, it's really not one of my strong points in my game, but, you know, it's definitely something I plan on improving on just by, you know, staying in the gym, getting up shots, and, you know, make sure I'm shooting it the same way every time. Now, uh, of course, one of the stories was that you didn't get an opportunity to work out with the Celtics because of timing. Um, let's say they do take you. How comfortable would you be playing for them if they select you at number three? I'd be extremely comfortable, you know, coming in to a program who's, well, an organization who's already, you know, established. They've got guys on the team who I feel can teach me a lot. And, um, you know, some young talent over there, too. I feel like we could have a pretty special team, and I feel like I could do really good over there. Josh, we haven't gotten a look at everybody on the red carpet, but it looks to me like they might be playing for second when it comes to the suit game. I mean, I don't know if that's velvet, but it's beautiful. <laughs> it looks fantastic. Are, are, are you the leader in the suit game when it comes to the rest of your, your fellow prospects? Uh, I think they've been coming in second ever since I seen them at the draft lottery. I think oh, I've had the best suit since, okay. ever since then. Confidence. I like the confidence. Yeah. See, that's part of it. It, it, it. It's one thing to be clean, but you got to wear it with confidence too, my man. So yes, sir. You win yes, it. Yes, sir. All right, well, enjoy the night. All the best to your family. Certainly going to be a special moment wherever you go. I know you guys didn't think we were going to let you go without getting a few jokes off on the Doing Too Much Countdown. I'm tired of this, though. I'm not even laughing. Y'all say Puig, he did what Puig does. 
He posed for a home run against the Mets last night. Wilma Flores, of course, didn't appreciate it. Sensitive. Also didn't appreciate Puig yelling a certain profanity at him as he was rounding the bases. I don't think he knows what having respect for, for the game is. And, uh, you know, we, we're playing horrible right now. We, we don't know he's... What did he say back to you? He said, <laughs> you. Well, that's well, the next evolution of flipping people off. But no, I'm so sick of this conversation. Even the NFL is loosening up. Right. Like, just that's part of his game. Players the game need to, stop. to get over themselves. And like, okay, you up. lecturing him. He's really going to change his mind? No. Come on now. That's not going to do it at all. It's not going to change. Look, if I could hit a baseball as far as we could, you'd admire I'd it. I'd admire it. I'd take a picture of it, pose with it. I get off a hot take, I look at him like, that was smart. <laughs> that's what I do all the time. <laughs> you never hesitate to compliment yourself. Uh, I don't know who will. Tom Brady. Maybe he's looking for a new offensive line here in Tokyo. So him versus... You didn't write that. <laughs> I did. You didn't write that. I did. That's <laughs> all Sam. Write. That's all Sam. <laughs> Tried his hardest. Oh, man. Living you his know. best life. He's serious about this Asian football thing, huh? Yeah, he is. He's over there. Wait, is that combine Tom Brady or current Tom Brady? See, this is current Tom Brady. And I'm glad you brought up combine Tom Brady. I, Look, I know my man is into health difference. and uh, he's eating all Five the right rings things. and millions of yards. But does his body actually look that much Look, different? I'm not one to talk. I told you, I have on the shirt when I'm a Do you, swimmer. Tom? Chief's doing too much with their firing uh, approach here. So Andy Reid gets a contract extension today. But they also fired general manager John Dorsey, who, of course, fired Jeremy Macklin over voicemail. So is this like next level karma? I guess. It, it just traded up for the quarterback. Uh, so in the draft. So this is this is crazy. So you fire somebody over voicemail and karma decides that you get fired after the draft before camp. We did a podcast about this and te- an ex is texting you like KD's ex did him. Check it out on uh, the ESPN Listen to that OG plug podcast. In, Mike. Shameless, right? J.R. Smith, change your password for real. Uh, he said his Facebook was hacked after <laughs> posting <laughs> goodbye Cavs. Had the nerve to tweet, I don't know what's going on with social media, but this is crazy. I'm not leaving the cast. It, somebody's out to get him. One, somebody's, two, three, out, somebody's out to destroy him. His password is password. <laughs> what, what, what's the password? What? The password is what? That must be his password, for real. Of course, remember when he said he was hacked? After saying Cavs and seven, because he he was like, no, why, he would he say, why would he say Mike, Cavs and seven? There'd have been some hashtag. So I, I kind of I don't they I know it's Jr. Access to Jr. Smith, they are not going for the money. They targeted they're going Jr. For the he's tar- he's being Come targeted. On. A conspiracy theory. <laughs> Whatever. Password might be Henny. I, I don't got know. some sexies on me, and you come over and you say what? If you say so. We have no... What are you, see, see, that's where it first started. So he was sleeping at the workout and see, sleeping on the subway. He likes to get his nap in. Um, Stephen A., what you think of what Phil Jackson is doing, homie? His very first move as the executive was to sign Lamar Odom. Who was on crack? Who was on crack? <laughs> Knicks fans. <laughs> Like, I feel your pain. Knicks fans probably want to do drugs right about now. <laughs> they all want to do they crack. Drink something, <laughs> something needs the pain. Stephen no. A, I just no, crack. No, <laughs> no, no, even true? no one can enunciate drugs the it's way Stephen A can. Right. It's going to be all right, Knicks No, it's not. It's, it's not going to be all right. right. They haven't traded him. Also. It's, it's, it can come back from this. Got the owner what about there? poor Mello? He's really trying to run him out of town. Oh, they're trying to be. Creed. Before we call it a day, tell the people who had a good day. All right. It is a good day for Guapo uh, from the Migos. If he wasn't so busy making hits, maybe he'd be in the NBA draft. He was seriously giving people buckets, most notably Shaq's son, Sharif, because he's slippery. Excuse me, believe me. Y'all get that. I know you do. I'm going to tell you it was a good day. Who's going to be a good day for him? It's your night. I hope he walks up on stage. Is your hip he... broken? Because it kind of looked that way. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you okay? He's spoken into existence. And his boy is going to the Lakers. Shout out to the ball family. We climbed about shoes and everything. It's their night. It's the kids' NBA night. Draft, draft is next. Is next. <laughs>